One-on-one -on -one talk with their CEO, Mike Shen. Yeah, okay, so you missed my culture slide, didn't you? The right up to the stuff, mammoth. I would describe it, uh, look, we really value freedom. And, and I don't just say that, I find it really annoying that we value freedom so much in our personal lives. And yet we go to work and it's just so easy for us to like, oh, hold on, start up. It's so easy for us to take our jackets off, hang it up on the shelf, and put freedom away. You know, why is it, why, that you're expected to answer an email at 9 o'clock at night? Or do some work on the weekend because it's urgent. But you're not expected to go see a movie at 4 o'clock on Tuesday. Or take your kid to the doctor at uh, 3 o'clock on Wednesday. You know, when work and life are blending so much, what is this weird traditional, again, why, thing of, well, yeah, you're supposed to be able to work all the time and, you know, be there from 9 to 6 or 10 to 5. So freedom is really important. Um, that's probably the, the most important thing that I value at work. Uh, I'd like to think our culture is fun. I, mean, I, I hope all of my colleagues think it's fun. I, I think they do have fun. Uh, that's really important to me because as we talked about with the other bloke, that if you're having fun, you're feeling more innovative. I mean, if you're depressed, you're not really very innovative, are you? You're like, eh, eh. Um, So freedom, fun, transparency, as I talked about, and gave an example of, of our financials being transparent. And there's a lot of trust. Like, I may not agree with something, but if everybody else, or even a couple people, are like, no, nah, Steve, you're wrong, we're doing this, I'll be like, okay, yeah, go for it, mate. I also have trust in the sense that I've got two rules, that's it. One is your customer's happy, the other is your team is happy. And apart from that, anything else goes. And so I trust that if we hire smart people, and since we hire them, we ask, gosh, gosh, we should trust them. Otherwise, why do we hire them? And uh, they'll just take care of the stuff. But they know what to do, they know what their job is, they know what their responsibilities are, and they'll do it. They're adults. So I treat them like adults, and like intelligent adults, and I don't sit there and go, did you do that? Are you doing it now? Can you, can you show me what you're doing? Can you give me a status report? I want my TPS report now on my desk? Yeah. Okay, hiring process. Um, we don't believe in HR. I think HR is idiotic. I think the entire idea of HR is stupid. It's like, we're going to have this organization over there hire for you because they're experts. And who cares if you have to work with that person for two years? I mean, come on, really. So what we do is we have our office manager, who is kind enough to post uh, an ad description on Jobs BD or wherever, Job Tiger, I don't care. So what happens when she needs somebody on her team, she goes to her office manager and says, look, here's a job description. Can you help me post it and organize some interviews? And my office manager goes, yeah, sure. What's her name? Denita. And so then Monica does that. She organizes them. And Denita runs all the interviews. Denita wrote the ad. Oh, because she has to work with these people. And Denitza sets the salary ranges. Because Denitza is trusted. And that's our interview process, uh, or our HR process, if you want to call it that. Um, I don't do much hiring because most of what we hire for is technical. But we're pretty, I mean, obviously we, we look at skill, like, you know, do you know the difference between men copy and men move or whatever it is. So sure, but as I said earlier, we also just go on gut feeling of, is this person cool? Do they fit in? Are they like us? Do they value the things we value? And if not, that's a hiring process. Sorry, you don't fit in, you're a tool for us. Tool being bad. Tool is a slang for idiot, sorry. Um, yeah, it's a pretty just simple process. Denita checks in to see if she thinks they're, they're educated and experienced, and if she likes them. She sets the salary, she does the hiring. I don't even set salary ranges anymore. It's kind of pointless. She knows how much revenue we make. She knows what we're charging the customer. She can figure out the profit. Yeah. Thank you. And I don't interview them either. The last. We spoke about crisis earlier. And um, speaking of crisis, how do you change the mindset of a girl who thinks that we are constantly in crisis for the last 20 or more years? How do you change the mindset? How do you make that happen or happen? Well, this is not trying to... It's really screechy. Sorry. Um, this is what I'm trying to say. It's like, well, first you have to wake up. You 
stop believing in this Western crap that we've been fed for 20 years. Maybe we're in crisis because we just fed this doctrine, this dogma that's brainwashed crap, right? Because they have to perpetuate it. If they don't perpetuate it, the entire economy collapses because they're based on consumerism. Pretty much. So the first thing you really have to do, what I'm trying to do, is say that you really are sheep. You're, you're seriously sheep. You should see the emails I've got recently from some of the students. It makes me want to vomit. Literally brainwashed McKinsey consultants. Like, it's amazing. So the first thing you have to do is wake up and seriously question this stuff. Does it work for me? I'm not kidding around a question why three times. I'm really obviously vehement about this. I, I honestly believe we're brainwashed sheep. Okay, it's not like that conspiracy theory, but we just somehow think that because this is the doctrine of trying calculus west, it's right. And this is why we're in crisis, because we're a small country that can't operate that way. We don't have the same resources, we don't have the same base, the same skill set. We have different skills and different things that make us unique. So just like every guy is going to come up here and go, find your passion, what makes you unique, and that's what we should do as an entrepreneur. They're right, that's what we should do as a country, too. We shouldn't just, and as a culture, absolutely. We should find the things that make Bulgaria special and make us cool, you know, whether that's a geographic location, whether that's traditional skill set, whether that's our soil and our natural resources, whether that's our mindset, whether that's our laws and our attitude, I don't care. We should then capitalize on those things. But instead, we're trying to be somebody else. We're trying to be Switzerland or the USA or the UK or Australia because that is success. It's wrong. I mean, if you believe any of these guys that come up here and say, do what you're passionate about and what makes you unique and build on those strengths, and they will, and what motivates you and find a great team, then why shouldn't you believe that as a nation, as a country? But we just don't question these things. I, I really think you have to sit there and go, what's right for me, what's right for the team, what's right for the country, and why, why, why? Why just because that's what I've read and my teacher in, in whatever, in, in business strategy told me this, is it right? It might have been right 100 years ago, it might be right for HP, but they're 400,000 people. And they're going down anyway, right? So, why do I want to emulate that? You've got to sit there and wake up and like give yourself a little slap and go, is this really right? And why? Be like a child again. You know, uh, Ken Robertson, the guy in education, he's brilliant. He's like, you know, we went, when we were a child, we're so creative, you know, clouds are castles, and then we go to school, and it's just stayed out of us. Bring back your childness and, and your natural curiosity and your strive for exploration and answers and for evaluation of the world around you. Bring that back. Sorry, I get ranting about stuff. So. Excuse me, Mr. Kyo, uh, can I please ask you to stand on the stage because a lot of people are getting neck pain? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Ow! Anyway, I get really ranting about this stuff because I believe it passionately. Like, one of the things I believe in is trying to create change, and, and that's why I come and I speak to you. Because I'm really fired up about it. <laughs> I need this happy drugs. In the past, uh, you know, the things that made me happy was uh, ecstasy and other stuff. You know, but the real things that made me happy are here. And if you're ready to take uh, pills for happiness for me. I'll be glad to. So, shall I read this? Shall I read it? Yeah, just not now. Okay. I'm sure that you can. It's in Bulgarian. It's in the Jamaican app. We're talking about trust. I trust you. I'm kidding. Thank you. I'm curious to know. I'm curious to know, um, after your company take the hit and you had to lower your salary and you took the punches, how many people became unhappy in your firm and because of this unhappiness, how many people did you have to fire? Okay, the hard question, how many did I fire? Alright, so um, at my company, during the, the nasty times, She's so kindly brought up. Thank you for reliving that pain. Um, luckily, we had a lot of contractors that were FTEs, full-time employees, and those guys were just on a monthly contract anyway for different projects. So those guys was really like a no-brainer, and they didn't really care. They had their own 
they're like the freelancers and stuff. So we gave them the one month notice and they're like, yeah, whatever. Um, there is, however, unfortunately, one guy that we ended up firing. Um, and I'm really kind of pissed off about it. It was probably the wrong choice because he's a really great developer and he was a cool guy. It's just that he had a, one of the higher salaries and he wasn't on a project. And we were like, oh, let's do it. In retrospect, it was wrong. It was the wrong decision. But it's easy to say that now because you know finally we got more customers and you know more revenue and we realized if we kept him, we'd be better off and okay we would have lost some money, but now he'd be part of the company still. But you know, we didn't have that vision of would we get more customers so quickly. So yeah, we tried one dude, and he kind of bummed out and sad about it. Um, also, two people quit. Um, and they quit because they said, okay, here's the financials, here's what's going on. I have this hypotheca, this loan, they have, a, they have a house loan, and I really need financial security, and I'm worried, and I got this great job offer from somebody else. But to their credit, they came to us first and said, okay, I have this job offer from this other company. Um, can you guarantee that some more revenue is coming we'd like to stay? And we said, well, we can't right now, so we don't blame you for quitting. Um, so we had two people quit that were full-time employees, and we did fire one person, uh, and it sucked. On the bright side, one of the guys that quit wants to come back, you know, that we have money for people, we might bring him back, which is cool. But, um, because of course other companies are much worse than ours. So, uh, but yeah, so we fired one, and we, two people quit on their own way, because they didn't feel financial security that they needed to pay their loans, which is totally reasonable. But, you know, fair enough, they want to go bankrupt because we made a simple system. Uh, one more, anybody? Here we go. Anybody want some? Folks? <laughs> All right. I can't read what you're doing very well, actually. Okay. So, so I just want to ask, if your idea is very revolutionary, and uh, what is the biggest stop uh, that you've seen actually from people trying to accept it? Is it their knowledge that the idea is plausible, or is it basically uh, trying to see how they're going to be in the future with that idea? Easy. Nobody actually really accepts my ideas. Most usually I get rejection. And I'll give you an example. Recently, an AUG student wanted to do a case study on our company. And so they interviewed me and a bunch of other people, and what came back made me really sad. It was, oh, these guys don't know what they're doing, where they're going, or what they even are. It was a really, really disappointing uh, result. They just didn't get my ideas. It was, uh, it almost just, I was just hit my head against the desk a few times. I was like, God, seriously, I don't want our company to do one year planning. I want us to ramble into discovery and innovation. I want us to ramble around and find things. I want us to just be free and do that in almost directionless. I'm not saying we don't have a strategy, we do, but I want this sense of rambling. I actually think that's good. A lot of these ideas I think are interesting and they're different, but I get rejection mostly to answer your question. It's not either of the things you suggested, unfortunately. It's, oh, that can't be right because we've had 100 years of experience. And, oh, you know what? I had experience from this EU training and this great teacher from America and I read this book and I went to this McKinsey lecture and blah, 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 and they said this is best practice, Steve, and there was just some weirdo with a seven score. And, you know, these McKinsey guys are fine. So, yeah, it's uh, unfortunately mostly rejection. Yeah. All right, well, with that, all of a sudden I'm getting kicked off by rants and my raves. I really, really don't wish you guys would question everything and turn into your childlike nature and actually value that. Um, and I promise you, when you do that, your startups and your businesses and your people will be more successful, whatever that means. <laughs>